All right, so this is one two variable stats. Uh, so let's take a look at it. Um, I want to make a, a dot plot with the following data. Okay, so the way to make a dot plot um, is you keep track of how much there are of each value. And we want to keep a y-axis that is consistent, right? Um, so this is how many times people fill up with gas each month. So um, I have four, uh, the, f the first one's four, five, six, uh, so on and so forth. So a couple different ways to do it. I'm just gonna look through and see how many zeros I have. So I have two zeros. So I'm just gonna put a dot there at one and a dot there at two. Um, how many people do I have with one? There are two people. Um, with the fill up twice, one, two, three, four. Um, three, one, two, three. Uh, four, I'm just seeing the three of them again. Um, five, I see two, and six, I see one. Um, so that's how you make a dot plot. It kind of looks kind of like a histogram, right? Um, but we're using this um, typically when we only have like integer values. Um, so people didn't fill up like 4.5 times or, or, or something like that, right? Um, uh, or if there's like a big range of the numbers. Uh, so let's start off with, uh, let's keep going to number two. I guess I wouldn't start off with it because it's the second thing I'm doing. Uh, Number two, they tell us um, we're going to make um, a histogram here um, that has a range from zero to 400. I'm just gonna do part of this. So I know I'm gonna go from zero to 400. Um, and they say I have a bin width of 50. So bin width just means what I'm counting by. So I'm gonna be counting by 50s. Oh boy. out of here 400 so it looks something like that um, and this is how much money uh, students spend at the food cart so let's take a look um, I'm basically gonna count up how many students spend between 0 and 50 bucks um, and as I'm counting I see someone with um, that spent $47 $20 $10 and zero dollars so I see five people that fit that bill. So one, two, three, four, five. So I've got five people right here. Uh, between 50 and 100, um, I see someone at 87, 90, 60. I just see those three. So between 50 and 100, I go up one, two, three, and that's how much I have. Um, when you get the rest of this thing graphed, it should have a shape that's something like this ish, right? Um, the next question uh, three asks you which way is this skewed? Um, this is skewed to the right because the outliers are on the right side, right? Um, so we always look for where the outliers are for the skew. So if our end histogram looked something like. Um, Uh, let's say like this, this would be skewed left because our outlier is on the left side, right? Um, so skew is really asking where the outliers, um, which side they're on. Okay. Uh, so in problem four, um, The, the solutions are included um, in, um, in, in the packet that I gave you. Um, so I'm not gonna go over uh, the exact solutions, but there's just a couple that um, could be, uh, you know, that I wanna explain how to, how to get them if you're, if you're stuck. The minimum obviously is the smallest answer. The maximum is the biggest answer, or the biggest uh, data point. Um, so if we have a minimum uh, of 64, I'm pretty sure, no, 55. Um, and we have a maximum of 73. 
Um, remember that the way to figure out the range then is I, I don't say it's between 55 and 73. The range is actually 73 minus 55, um, which is 18. So in this case, the range is 18. Um, remember the way to find quartile one and quartile two. Um, if I put all of the, the numbers in order from the smallest number to the biggest number, um, one, I find the median, three, four, four, five, five. I find the median number like this, right? Um, and that's the median number. In this case, I have two middle numbers, so I just find the number that's right in between them. To find the quartiles, I take the median of the low end, right? So what I do is I take all these numbers on the low end, and I find the median of them. So not that number, not that number, not that number, not that number. And so I have two in the middle. So I would just take the average of those two numbers. That's the, that's the first quartile. Um, same thing here. I take not that number, not that number, not that number, not that number. So it's the average of those two. That's the third quartile. Um, so that's how you find those numbers. Um, when they say interquartile range, we do the exact same thing. If my third quartile is 68 and my first quartile is 60, my interquartile range is 8 because I take 68 minus 60. That may not be what they are in this problem, um, but that's how you find it, right? So once you arrange all the data um, from lowest to highest and, and, and do that, you should get those solutions. Um, the mode is the most common number. Remember, you can have um, a two modes, three modes. Um, so in this case, I have uh, two 68s and two 70s. So my mode is 68 and 70. Um, uh, and mean, you just add them all up and divide by how many there are. Um, okay, so moving on to number five. Um, I have two players. I have Ricky Raindrops and, uh, and Barry Bounce Pass. Um, basically both arguing um, who's better. Uh, if I look at their box and whiskers, though, you'll see it's not much of a contest. So this is Ricky Raindrops. Um, he has a minimum at 10, first quartile at 20, um, 35 is his median, um, 40 and 50. Um, Barry Bounce Pass is uh, also has a minimum of 10, and one night he went off at 50. Um, it's down to 15 there. That looks like that's like 17. That's 20. Like that. Okay. So Barry Bounce Pass is basically arguing that since they both have a max of 50 and a minimum of 10, um, that they're the same caliber of basketball player. Um, so you have to just use some some data to to back up why Ricky Raindrops legitimate legitimately is better. Um, so you can use all sorts of different ones for this one. It's pretty straightforward. You can, you can use their medians to make an argument. Uh, half the time, Ricky Raindrop scores more than 35. Um, and you can say, compare that to Barry Bounce Pass, who only half the time scores more than 17. Um, so you can use that as an argument. Um, you can also use uh, their, uh, their quartiles to make an argument, um, which kind of leads us into uh, question B. So if you look at 5B, they ask, um, what percent of the time do they score more than 20 points? So here's 20 points right here. Quartile split it into, into, thir uh, into third, quartile split it into thirds, that's ridiculous. Quartile split it into fourths, um, where this represents 25% of the data, this represents 25% of the data, 25% of the data, 25% of the data. Um, so this is another way you can tell that Ricky Raindrops is better. 75% um, of the time, he scores more than 20 points. Because um, this is 25, 25, 25 for a total of 75% of the time. Compare that to Barry Bounce Pass, who 25%, 25%, 25%, who 75% of the time doesn't score more than 20 points. And only one section is above 20. So only 25% of the time does he score more than um, 20 points. So that would be another way to um, make the argument. Um, it's also the answer for, for Part B. Um, so doing part C and part D, 
uh, for this question. Ah. To repair my lines. Choo, choo, choo. Um, part C, they say, what uh, is the interquartile range uh, for Ricky raindrops? So interquartile range is quartile one minus, uh, sorry, quartile three minus quartile one. So 40 minus 20. So part C, the solution is 20. Now D, they ask us, what's the total range for Barry bounce pass? That's the maximum minus the minimum. So 50 minus 10, which is 40. Um, cool. Uh, let's flip on to the second page here. And do... Six. So my values are nine, um, six, five, one, four, ten, eight, zero, and two. Uh, they want me to find the mean deviation. So the mean deviation, I have to do one thing first. I have to find the mean. Um, so nine plus six plus five plus one plus four plus ten plus eight plus zero plus two. Uh, divided by there's one two three four five six seven eight nine divided by nine so the first thing is I found that the mean is five so mean deviation is I'm trying to figure out how far all of these are off the mean so basically what I do is say like how far off of five are is each one of these so I'm just gonna write a five above every single one of them Five minus four, that's four off the mean, that's one off the mean, that's zero off the mean, that's four, one, five, three, five, three. Now you notice I don't have any negatives in there. I'm just trying to figure out how far off it is. So you can think about this as the absolute value of it um, or just the distance away it is from the mean. So this is the distance away each one of my values are from the mean. So to find the mean deviation, I just find the mean of this. So the mean deviation um, is going to be 4 plus 1 plus 0 plus 4 plus 1 plus 5 plus 3 plus 5 plus 3 divided by, there's 9 of them. So you should get 2.8 repeating, right? Or 2 and 8 ninths if you're fancy. Um, okay. So moving on to question... Yo, yo, yo. Uh, this is kind of going to be 7, 8, and 9. Um, I have that table. So you want to find the line of best fit from the table. Uh, so basically what you're going to do in your calculator is you're going to click Stat, Edit. Um, and when you click Stat and Edit, you're going to get um, uh, a blank table like this. Um, you're going to put in your data. Um, Feel free to skip over this part in the video. It'll just take me a couple seconds. data entered. Now I'm going to click stat. I'm going to go right to calculate. I'm going to go down to number four because that's going to give me the line of best fit. That one right there. I don't know if you can see it. Whoa. Yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. Click enter, enter, and I'm going to get this. That's going to tell me the equation of the line. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of rounding on mine, um, but I'm going to get my line of best fit is 43x plus 143. You may have got 142, but it's 142.8, so I'm just going to go to 143. Okay, so question eight, they say, using your line of best fit, what would you expect him to earn on the 73rd day? Um, or, or I guess I should say, how much should he have saved on the, on the 73rd day? Um, that's poorly worded. Um, you have to look where I'm going to be plugging that 73 in. Am I going to be plugging that 73 in for x or for y? Um, days are an X value. If you look at the table, days is in the X column. So 
for me on the 73rd day, I'm gonna plug in 73 for x. And I'm gonna solve this thing. So 43 times 73 plus 143. Um, on day 73, we'd expect him to have that much money uh, saved up. Uh, so that's how you do, um, that's how you do eight. So let's transition on to question nine. They said, okay, so when would you expect him to have uh, 10 grand saved up? So the amount saved is uh, the Y value. So the Y value is 10,000. So I'm gonna plug that in for, for Y. So that's gonna equal 43X plus 143. So I'm gonna subtract 143 from both sides. Nine, eight, five, seven equals 43x. Um, and I'm going to divide both sides by 43. And I get on day 29. I get 229.23, um, but just rounding, right? Um, Yep, so basically with the line, sometimes you plug in for Y, sometimes you plug in for X. Uh, it's kind of the story of all of algebra um, this year. It just the trick is knowing which one um, to do it in. Uh, and for that, look at context clues or, or at the table. Um, question number 10, they tell us uh, to plug in, or no, sorry, sorry, to draw a line with weak negative correlation. So negative correlation means it goes down like this. Weak means that all of the data points aren't close to the line of best fit. So this is strong correlation where all the data is just like right on that line. It's like it's pretty much dialed in, right? Weak correlation is like this top one where overall you can see the trend of things going down, but um, you know not every single point is, is right on there. There's some, some outliers to it. So what would be um, uh, a good example of this? Um, I'll just say hours spent studying and uh, mistakes on final. Sure, there's someone that's going to spend 10 hours studying, and they're still going to make some mistakes, right? They're a little bit of an outlier, but most people that study up all the way here are going to make very few mistakes. Um, same thing, there's, uh, there could be some people that study... Um, just one hour, right? Um, barely do anything, and they, they make relatively few mistakes. But there's going to be people that study um, that long and, and make a lot of mistakes. But the general trend is the more you study, um, the less mistakes you make. You can come up with any example that you want there, but it should be something like that. Okay. Um, this one, uh, 11 is going to be a little bit tricky um, to do on this platform. Uh, but I'll give it my darndest. Um, they tell us to make a scatter plot, right? Um, and it's going to basically end up looking something like that. You're going to plot those points, right? And you're going to have your and you're going to have your your line of best fit that's going to look like that. Uh, they tell you to draw the upper and lower bounds. So this is the line of best. Now to draw the upper and lower bounds, you take the point that's the highest up and you draw a line parallel to it that goes through that. That is the upper bounds, right? To find the lower bounds, you take the point that's the furthest off it, this point right here, you draw a line parallel, and that's the lower bounds. Um, now these are not exact numbers, obviously. Um, this is a, a cruddy looking sketch. Um, but when you, when you plot it on um, that graph I have provided for you, uh, you should see something similar. So what they ask us to do is they say, okay, using the upper and lower bounds, estimate how much a three foot python would weigh. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to three foot, uh, a three foot python, and you're gonna say on the low end, I'd expect it to weigh whatever this value is for you. Now the way that you draw it um, may look a little bit different from how your neighbor would draw it, but maybe that's like one pound or two pounds or, or whatever. That's using the lower bound to make an estimate. So that's a lower bound estimate. Let's continue up to our upper bound estimate. And it's whatever this value is, is our max value. So maybe if your lower bound was one, your maximum value would be like seven. 
So using our lower and upper bounds, it comes up with like a range that we could have. So we would say it's between one and seven pounds. Um, a three foot python would be between one and seven pounds. Now your specific numbers may differ um, just based on how you drew your line of best fit. Um, there's a little bit of error in that um, and how you drew your upper and lower bounds. Um, but that's more or less the idea. Uh, the last question is what does the slope mean in this situation? The slope is how far you go over and how far you go up. It's the rise over run. So that means every time that the, the bow constrictor goes up one foot, how many pounds does it gain? Um, so same thing with yours, it may be, look a little bit different. Maybe it goes up a pound and it's gaining, uh, it goes up a foot, seven more pounds. Every foot, seven more pounds. Um, so that's each additional foot, how much more um, it weighs. But once again, that answer is going to determine, uh, be determined kind of on how you drew the line. So there's a little bit of um, give, or, give or take on that one. Okay.